Good afternoon and welcome to a research proposal. What I'm going to do is walk you through a really good research proposal written by a student. And if you haven't uh, taken a look at that uh, research proposal yet, go to Blackboard and, and please uh, take a look at it. Stop the uh, slideshow now and go do that. First off, what is a research proposal? A research proposal is almost exactly similar to a normal manuscript uh, that is a normal research paper except for three differences. Uh, the method section is written in the future tense because this, these are things that you plan to do. Uh, the results section doesn't have any results in it so you just describe the statistical tests that you plan to use and also uh, include a power analysis that is an analysis of how many uh, subjects you'll need uh, to have the power that you want. And then the discussion section doesn't have any results to discuss, so usually it you know, exists as a what-if discussion of the implications of the study if it was successful. When do you write a research proposal? Uh, psychology majors are often assigned to write a research proposal for upper-level classes. Uh, senior theses usually require some type of research proposal before the uh, data is collected. An ethical review board, the IRB, will want to have some type of proposal before they uh, review an experiment. Uh, to receive a research grant, you will need to have a research proposal. And to conduct a master's thesis or doctoral dissertation. So obviously we're really interested in that first point. Uh, when psychology majors like you are you know, assigned by their professors to do a research proposal. I'm going to be taking a look at a research proposal done uh, by a student of mine and this was probably back in like 1994 when I was teaching at Wright State University. Uh, Wright State's in Dayton, Ohio and they have a pretty good psychology department there. It has a master's level graduate program in human factor psychology. Uh, and uh, here's their home page. And uh, there's Professor Flack, who actually I uh, co-taught research methods with uh, when I was there. Uh, I never saw the guy smile when I was there. And now that he's chair and had to take the official photo, he tried really hard to smile. I can tell that. And now we get to the manuscript. I said earlier in another uh, slideshow that I was going to talk about the differences between an article and a manuscript. The manuscript is what you uh, create after it's published as an article. The major difference is going to be, of course, in the way it's uh, laid out. You're not going to do all of the formatting that's done for a uh, published article. So it's just going to look like this. And the major difference will be the first page. Uh, what we have up on the top are the keywords, locus and attractiveness, and the page number. Uh, then we have the running head. Uh, the running head is instructions to the journal that if you're going to publish my paper, uh, this is what I want to have the header on the page to be. And then you have the title and the author's name and the author's affiliation. Uh, the key words, in this case, locus and attractiveness, uh, these are just words that label the pages. So let's say that I drop your paper and somebody else's. I can, uh, and, they, and the pages get all mixed up, I can sort them out based on the key words. So uh, I found this when I was cleaning out my office after, or unpacking my office after I had to move uh, for renovations this summer. And uh, this was just the paper, so what I did was I scanned it into a computer and had, uh, you, know, uh, you know, optical, uh, whatever, OCR uh, software read it. So if there are some minor problems with it, like the capital, uh, capital O and of in the title, that's probably the computer and not Brenda. But the manuscript starts, the introduction section starts with the title of the paper. Uh, and she has a very good title uh, in the form of something about the independent variables on the dependent variables, which she's done very well. And then she'll begin with a introductory paragraph. And as I said before, the introdu introductory paragraph will describe uh, the area that you're working in and what you plan to do. And if you take a minute to read this introductory paragraph, you have a very good idea the area she's working in and 
also what she's generally planning to do. And if we move on down pa uh, the second page, uh, we see that, yes, indeed, she does begin to explain to us that she's very interested in blame and sexual assault. And so by the end of the second paragraph, we pretty much know the area she's working in and what she wants to do. Uh, then she jumps into the uh, literature review, uh, talking about blame. And she talks about more blame and more research. And then now we come to a major section of her literature review. She's decided to put all of the material on physical attractiveness uh, in one section. And so what she's done is she's given us a section heading to help the reader make the transition from her introductory part of her literature review into a more specific part about physical attractiveness. And then she has another major section on physical attractiveness and rape. And at this time, why don't you take a look at how she's going about writing about each one of the research studies. Uh, more recently, investigators have begun to turn their attention to possible limitations of the what is beautiful is good stereotype. Uh, Dermer and Thiel, 1974, demonstrated that on some dimensions of physical attractiveness, individuals are less positively viewed. They found that physically attractive females were judged to be more egotistical, vain, likely to request a divorce, and have an extramarital affair, blah, blah, blah. So notice how she's going about describing the research that she's uh, reviewing. She's giving us a paragraph to a half a paragraph overview of what they did and what they found. And then we see another major section on social learning theory. And then moving on, we see a subsection of social learning theory on internal locus of control. So what she's doing is she's giving us, in a very orderly fashion, the information we need to follow along her thinking in terms of uh, why she thinks her hypothesis is good enough to test and how she's going to go about testing it, which I said are the goals of every introduction section. Now, if you compare this to Hugenberg and Bodenhausen's introduction, you'll notice that this is much longer. And that's generally true. Uh, usually student papers have a much longer introduction because students are expected to demonstrate that they understand the research articles they're talking about. So uh, students may have to write a little bit more about each one of the research articles. And then she goes on to talk about the construction of Rotter's internal and external locus of control scale. And so this is a very good section here. And I think now what I should do is, uh, you know, go on a little diversion to talk about, uh, you know, w why this paper is so good. Uh, one reason this paper is so good is, you know, uh, Brenda, of course, she was a brilliant student, but another reason is the program that she went to. And I mentioned that uh, Wright State Psychology Department had a master's program in human factors. Uh, so you had, a, uh, you know, graduate level professors teaching the undergraduate courses. Not only that, but all the professors were very, very active in research, and so they were using a lot of student researchers. So often, students would become involved in a professor's research by being in the professor's class and also by getting a job or doing a independent study working in the professor's lab. And uh, many of the BS students, the bachelors of science students, in sci students in psychology, were doing things like that. Uh, also, uh, I just mentioned another difference. At York, we, on we only offer a BA or Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. Uh, at Wright State, they offered a BA or a BS. And if you were a BS student, uh, you had to take extra classes uh, which were more scientifically oriented. You had to take research methods, the first class in the major, right after intra psych. Uh, so that got you focused on research much more qu quickly than we do now.
So Brenda had been in many classes before mine uh, where she had to write about this or write about that. She had been working with professors and had been exposed to uh, you know, uh, the different types of research and different research articles. And so by the time she finally came to my class, which was uh, an upper level class in uh, personality research, uh, she had been, for example, uh, in my upper level class on the research about attributions and sexual assault and she wrote a paper for me uh, you know, in that class. Uh, she had been in other classes where she had written papers about Rotter's IE uh, you know, scale. So basically for, you know, the, I think you know, she was graduating that semester, this one of the last classes she was taking, she went back and took a lot from the papers that she's written before. All of these were for experimental classes, so she had a sizable portfolio of papers she could draw from. So that's why this paper seems so professional, uh, because she just had a lot of experience. Uh, you know, so uh, I think this is a really good model for the papers I'm expecting for research methods at the end of the semester. Uh, a good model, but I don't uh, expect uh, your papers to be as polished as this one because, uh, frankly, Brenda had a lot of resources available to you, to her that, uh, unfortunately, you don't have.